Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to be talking about a recent paper that we've published in the Proceedings for Royal Society B, and it's about 3D ecosystem mapping techniques and technologies and how we're seeing um, a, a recent increase and a lot of potential future uses for these techniques. So in this talk, we're gonna follow the structure of the paper really. So I'll start with a bit of an introduction and a background to remote sensing in ecology, and then discuss two really high potential, high remote sensing, uh, high resolution remote sensing tools that um, can be used in, in field ecology and spatial ecology. I'll discuss some of the accuracy concerns and the ways that we set out to address some of these concerns for structure for motion photogrammetry in particular, and then talk about some of the areas in which uh, 3D mapping has a lot of potential for ecology. So organisms interact with their environment in uh, 3D ecosystem space at multiple scales. Um, and despite the, the, the fact that we're well aware of this, mapping and uh, spatial ecology is often conducted in 2D space. And this is very appropriate in a lot of cases, particularly at broad spatial scales. But when we look a bit closer and at finer spatial scales, the 3D nature of in environments and ecosystems um, and the 3D, um, the 3D data collection becomes more important. But how do we capture this 3D information? Well, traditionally it's been quite challenging. There have been ways to capture accurate point measurements of elevation for many years. So theodolites and more recently GPS can be used to capture point measurements of elevation and chain and tape rugosity measurements can be used to capture uh, the, the structural complexity in habitats, uh, particularly widely used in coral reef studies. So these techniques offer um, limited spatial extent and you have to um, conduct a lot of these measurements to, to build up a detailed picture and a detailed um, representation of the ecosystem. More recently, in, uh, well, within the last 20 years or so, we're seeing uh, a lot more remote sensing data becoming available and remote sensing earth observation data is now uh, everywhere we look. So Google Earth is very um, familiar to a lot of people. There are sources of high resolution satellite imagery anywhere in the world available on a daily um, return basis. And global topography and bathymetry data sets are available um, at uh, relatively coarse spatial scales, spatial resolutions in some cases, but these really broad extent data sets are available for use in investigations. At a finer spatial scale, um, Airborne LIDAR is now uh, becoming more and more available. So data sets of these finer resolution elevation information um, are becoming more widely available. This is an example from Wales, uh, where I'm based of the, the LIDAR coverage at a two meter resolution. And similar data sets are available for the seabed for uh, bathymetry. But it's still challenging to record uh, really accurate topography at really fine spatial scales. Um, so on sub-meter spatial scales where so many ecological processes um, and interactions take place. So an invertebrate community, for example, might not respond to two meter variation in topography and uh, the, the centimeter or millimeter scale structural complexity might be much more important to them. And it's also these, observa these earth observation technologies often tend to have a, a top-down look of the ecosystem. So uh, it's challenging to capture vertical structures, overhanging structures, and multi-layered or really complex environments like um, under canopies of forests or, or coral reefs, for example. But nowadays there are technologies and techniques uh, which offer some um, uh, ways to overcome some of these limitations. 
Uh, so I'll talk about two of perhaps the most accessible and available techniques to um, with a lot of potential for field ecology. These are structure from motion photogrammetry and laser scanning. So these techniques both generate detailed 3D information with very high resolution and accuracy. They do so in, in very different ways. And although they've been around for a number of years now, there's been relatively uh, slow uptake across ecology in general. Uh, and most of the, the published papers have been uh, emerged in the last few years. However, I'm talking to, I think, a lot of coral reef scientists here today. Um, and this is one area which is seeing a lot of interest in particularly structure from motion photogrammetry because of the need to capture that really detailed um, 3D information of these really complex environments. The other area uh, within ecology that's seeing a lot of interest um, with laser scanning is uh, within forest systems where the airborne or satellite derived data sets um, can't penetrate through, through canopies. So this under canopy structure and habitat complexity uh, can be captured using things like terrestrial laser scanning. So for, particularly for those perhaps less familiar with um, these, these techniques, I'll just give a brief overview. So structural promotion photogrammetry is a technique that uses a set of overlapping photographs to build up the geometry of a scene in the same way that our stereoscopic vision works for uh, with depth, depth perception. So the, um, the technique identifies the same features in multiple different photos from slightly different angles and uses their relative positions to build up a full 3D map and 3D model. It's a passive remote sensing technique because it uses reflected light from a different from an external source, so either sunlight or um, dive torch or something like that. And it can be lo very low cost because uh, all you really need is a digital camera and uh, there are free or and cheap software options within the processing side of it. But the flexibility of the, the technique does mean that there's a number of places where error can creep in, a number of sources of error. And so really careful quality control is required to make sure that the the products uh, are as accurate as they may, may first appear. So when I say the, uh, and these are digit, um, a set of overlapping photographs, these photos can be taken from uh, any platform really. So either handheld, commonly drone mounted cameras are used. In this example in the top right, um, vegetation is being modeled with uh, aerial imagery from a drone. And here, a vertical marine hab, um, structure habitat is being modelled using imagery from ROVs. And this was actually video footage, um, which was turned into stills, and then those stills are used to, to conduct the modelling. So you can see how it can, can be used in relatively inaccessible habitats. Laser scanning, on the other hand, is a, a very different technique that produces similar data data products in, in terms of the 3D data that it produces. Laser scanning is an active remote sensing technique because it emits its own energy and then records the, um, the reflections of those. So it emits pulses of laser light uh, and records uh, the reflections of those laser pulses to build up uh, millions of individual measurements of the surfaces surrounding the, the equipment. So by combining lots of these scans, um, you can build up a detailed 3D in, uh, representation of the environment. It's a, a more expensive technique because it requires uh, purpose-built precision instruments rather than just a, a camera. And uh, it can come in a number of different forms, a number of different platforms. So airborne, la um, airborne LIDAR, which I've mentioned previously, is a form of laser scanning. It's a laser scanner mounted on a plane. Terrestrial laser scanning, seen here in this photo where we're uh, modeling a rocky shore, is uh, commonly used in construction industry and it's quite an established technique. Um, as I said, it can be very useful for modeling understory habitats in forests. Um, 
In this example, the, the gray is taken with the, uh, a terrestrial laser scanner. And the green is uh, data collected with a handheld mobile laser scanner. So there are wearable options and handheld options that allow you to walk around the scene and move around the scene, which offers a bit more flexibility, perhaps more practical for um, really complex environments. And even underwater laser scanners are being developed as well. So one advantage of, of this technique over structure from motion photogrammetry is that it, uh, it provides some kind of inherent accuracy and, cal um, and precision. So you can be a little bit more confident that walking away from your field site, you've captured a, an accurate model of what you, uh, you were interested in. So there, to address some of these concerns about the accuracy of structure formation photogrammetry for field work, field ecology in particular, we decided that um, we set out to, to address some of these concerns and, and measure the, uh, see how good we could get the um, models from this technique uh, for, to test whether it was an appropriate technique for us to use in a variety of ecological studies that we were interested in collect, uh, conducting. So we compared um, a best case scenario, uh, practical best case scenario uh, data collection of um, for, and modeling for structure formation with a terrestrial laser scanner data set at um, three different habitats and at three different scales. Um, we found that uh, the, the results on the right here, you can see um, we found that in, in stable and uh, solid substrate habitats, um, sorry, I'll just explain this a little bit. <laughs> the, uh, so what we did was we, we collected 3D models using the two di different techniques. And then at uh, 100,000 positions within those models, we measured the distance between the two models. Okay, so these density plots um, describe those measurements and the distances between the, the two models. So each of the curves, uh, there's uh, the area under each of the curves is equal. And you can see that as they, they all peak around zero, that shows that uh, they're on average, the, the models agree very closely and they align very well. However, you can see that as we move from the stable uh, rocky shore habitats to uh, a perhaps less stable, more complex salt marsh habitat, um, the curves spread out. So this shows that there's more, there are more areas within those models that they're, they're disagreeing. And similarly, as we move from uh, fine scale um, observation up to a, a broader scale, a lower resolution observation, the, the curves also spread out, again showing that there's, that although they align very well on average, there's more spread in the data, there's more areas where the, the um, models are are different. And this is because of the inherent differences between the techniques um, and in particular structure for motion tends to generalize and smooth out some finer scale features and details relative to the, the pixel size of the images that are collected. So um, at the finer scales in the salt marsh those fine those little um, blades of grass and sort of uh, twigs and bits of vegetation um, are generalized into smooth surfaces and even at uh, the, the sort of more stable uh, larger feature habitats like rocky shores uh, at the, when you go to broader scales and lower pixel resolution you tend to smooth out some of the sort of sharp edges um, and smooth over some of the like the rocks and boulders and things like that so um, structure formation models can be very variable can be very accurate but their, their accuracy depends on a lot of things and they can vary according to uh, the equipment used so the camera the lens the camera settings uh, the methods used um, in, in the method used to actually collect those images uh, the characteristics of the scene as we've seen um, finer scale complexity can, can uh, make a difference to the, the quality of the, the outputs and environmental conditions, so weather, whether you've got cloud, um, different sort of uh, sunlight characteristics. If you're underwater, then the turbidity of the water um, 
the, the sort of how, how wavy it is, how much um, uh, light refraction you're getting from the sunlight. So all these things can, can affect the quality of the, the models. So there's certainly a need for standardization and for some objective quantification of the amount of error and the accuracy in these, these models if they're going to be used, compared among different studies. So once we're happy that we're able to collect these accurate representations of the ecosystem, well, what can we use them for? Well, there's a huge variety of potential ecological applications for this kind of information. Um, and it really enables us to start asking new questions that weren't, we weren't really able to ask before because of the technology, uh, technological limitations. And also ask uh, more familiar questions perhaps at uh, new spatial scales um, and new temporal scales, um, perhaps more organism-centric scales and mechanistic scales rather than being limited by uh, the logistical constraints, some trade-offs that uh, are often have to be made. So I'll just go over a few broad themes where um, there have been some interesting applications or potential future applications of, of this detailed 3D mapping. So understanding relationships between uh, organisms and habitat structure is a really um, is one area that there's a lot of potential for this. So in, in coral reef um, examples, this is, this is one area where uh, these technologies are, are really seeing um, a lot of potential because it enables us to uh, better characterize and quantify that habitat complexity in a way that's robust and repeatable, which means um, more robust um, predictor variables can be used to, to feed into statistical analysis. Topography also influences a lot of other variables. So in the same way that broad scale modeling of hydrodynamic energy can be conducted, really fine scale um, modeling can be, can be conducted of uh, things like pH of water or soil, temperature to map microclimates, microhabitats, hydrodynamic force can be modeled and mapped on sort of centimeter scales. Um, and this can be in turn fed into things like species uh, distribution models, habitat suitability models. Uh, there's been some examples of uh, benthic uh, hard, uh, hard substrate habitats in which suspension feeders show a preference for, um, on the scale of centimeters for areas which have uh, different topography because they generate turbulence in the water and generate more um, potential food resource. It also allows us to generate, um, to develop new experimental approaches. So in this example, a, um, shown here, a rocky shore has been modeled at, um, at sort of high resolution and that model has been used to pr um, produce a 3D printed tile and then that tile has been deployed on an artificial uh, coastal substrate. This is to explore why um, there are differences in the diversity of the colonizing communities in natural rocky shores compared to artificial substrates and whether it's because of something to do with the, uh, the topography of the natural rock rocky shore. So another area um, is in measuring and monitoring small, slow and complicated variation in 3D form. So again, uh, a lot of organisms grow in very complex shapes and being able to quantify these shapes accurately rather than having to simplify them adds a lot of value um, and, and, and can, can make our uh, ecological and can improve our ecological understanding. Um, Coral reefs are, uh, again, a good example of this, where these sort of small complex growth forms occur. Uh, one example here is from a PhD chapter in a piece of work that's in preparation at the moment, um, where we've been monitoring and, and mapping the 3D topography of an intertidal biogenic reef. These reefs are built by aggregations of polychaete worms. And we've been able to track and map the, uh, these complicated 
complex 3D growth forms and how they grow and erode over a number of years. And these um, patterns and, and uh, of variation in the topography occur over a scale of centimeters, millimeters to centimeters sometimes. And so you can see why how um, having the accuracy and precision and detail of these uh, 3D mapping techniques allows us to investigate uh, things like patterns and scales of topographic variation through, through space and time. So having um, the ability to uh, rapidly record a really detailed snapshot of the environment can be really valuable to, um, to fieldwork. Enables us to perhaps separate tasks that can be more efficiently uh, completed by taking this snapshot and, and spending more time analyzing the environment in the lab from tasks that really require human interaction with the environment um, during fieldwork. So this really could enable us to really optimize um, fieldwork when things like dive bottom time are, are so valuable. It enables to make us to make the most of things like tidal windows, weather, weather windows, uh, perhaps visas. Um, so really optimizing that, that field time. Uh, you can see also how you could um, start to conduct virtual sampling for some variables, things like percent cover or sort of um, broad cover or, or, of um, certain species. And again, mapping the rugosity from a 3D model is perhaps more robust and more efficient than um, measuring it in the field using chain and tape. You can also, um, by capturing these highly detailed data sets, um, you can actually also um, use the data for, for multiple purposes and multiple, or analyze them at multiple scales or archive the, this detailed information for future use in a study that, that, you, that needs that kind of um, detailed or multi-scale information. Oops. Um, so uh, having this, this kind of detailed 3D information is also really valuable for uh, environmental management. So efficient management requires um, An effective management requires like a detailed understanding of natural scales of variation in systems um, and it requires accurate information to make uh, good evidence-based decisions. Uh, the, the, um, this kind of data is also really useful for things like education and public engagement because the, the visual data products are really um, quite impressive and quite engaging. So it immediately um, is quite easy to get people interested in your work. Uh, and the data could be combined with um, and integrated with other technologies uh, like VR, for example, virtual reality systems. So uh, for either public engagement or, or education, um, I'd love to see a, a classroom full of um, students in full scuba gear conducting a, a virtual scuba diving survey. So that's a challenge for someone out there. So in summary, these, there are tools available now um, that are accessible to non-specialists and becoming more and more common, commonly used, um, that enable us to capture really detailed, really uh, accurate 3D information about ecosystems. This can be really valuable in developing new questions, new, new, new avenues of research, and going back to perhaps more familiar questions and addressing them at um, new scales, perhaps more organism-centric scales, more mechanistic scales, whereas before um, these sort of logistical trade-offs meant that, that uh, some, some studies had to be limited in some way. And as I said, the, the use of these tools is gonna to be become increasingly more common. We're going to see some uh, really innovative, interesting, exciting research coming out in the, the near future. But challenges do remain. Uh, there are some barriers to, to uptake, uh, to widespread uptake, um, particularly in converting. So it's, it's, while it's relatively easy to go and collect this 3D information now, 
converting that and processing that into um, useful and mechanistic variables that can be fed into statistical analysis is still a challenge. Uh, there are other challenges like costs of laser scanning, for example, might be prohibitive um, to, to some groups and um, processing power for, for, to generate some of this information can be um, quite challenging sometimes. And of course, data storage isn't free. And there's certainly a need for standardization of particularly uh, structure from motion photogrammetry data collection in order to make really robust comparisons of uh, the results of different studies. So thank you very much for your time. Um, thanks for listening. And I'd like to thank Sonia for inviting me here. Um, I'd also like to thank my, my supervisors and colleagues and co-authors. A lot of people um, have helped uh, in, in a lot of this work. And I'd like to say um, I'd be very happy to, to speak to anyone. I'd, I'd love to hear from anyone if you would like to discuss anything I've been talking about, um, more information or uh, to discuss any future collaborations. So thank you very much.